To today's speaker, Jennifer Michael Hecht, is, uh, is brought to us by the President's Office, President's Office, the Wellness Resource Center, the, and the Chaplain's Office. Uh, I'm here for the Academic Events Committee to introduce the introducer. But I should also amen, uh, mention that all of the first Mondays um, owe a lot to the hard work of the Blue Key Society, and I hope you'll thank your friends who are in that one as well. Um, so I'm introducing uh, uh, Heather Horton, who knows uh, all the facts that you want to know about uh, our speaker. Um, Heather is the, uh, was, was hired as the very first sexual assault response co uh, coordinator on this campus um, some uh, several years ago. I remember with what silliness they referred to that campaign. We were trying to hire a sexual assault coordinator, and I knew that wasn't right, but uh, they finally started using the whole name. Tara Misra is the current uh, 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 servant in that role. Um, anyway, so Heather Horton is, is the director now of the Wellness Resource Center under which the SARC uh, works. And, and uh, I'll just say that she has 20 years of experience providing mental health services and her current work uh, to a great extent is involved in implementing programs focused on preventing violence, promoting mental health, and creating a uh, healthy and caring campus community. I will invite Heather up to make the rest of the introduction. Well, welcome. I am very honored to introduce our distinguished speaker, to you today. And I do want to send out a couple of special thank yous to President Jill Tiefenthaler and to uh, the Vice President and Dean of Student Life, Dean Edmonds, for helping to support today's program and follow-up conversations. After her talk this morning, Jennifer will be taking part in the Chaplain's Office Spiritual Journeys conversation in Sacred Grounds, if you'd like an opportunity to interact with her in a more intimate setting. And additionally, on Thursday at 12.15, we'll be hosting um, a follow-up conversation for the community in Sacred Grounds. Jennifer Michael Hecht earned a bachelor's degree in history from Adelphi University and a PhD in the history of science from Columbia University. She's received many awards and critical acclaim for her um, scholarly writings as well as for her poetry. She's taught creative writing at NYU and the MFA programs at Columbia University and the New School in New York City. In her powerful book, Stay, A History of Suicide and the Arguments Against It, Jennifer constructs an argument to convince those who contemplate suicide to make the choice to stay among the living. She focuses our attention on two things that we can and do easily lose sight of, the immense and unknown possibilities of our future selves and our deep and abiding need for one another. I believe strongly in the importance of a compassionate community that comes together to challenge with difficult questions and issues, to find common ground, and to support one another. So I'm incredibly pleased to see such a large crowd always coming together. Um, but today, I feel that the topic for which we are coming together and the speaker we've come to hear is especially appropriate for our first Monday's talk, which provides our campus community with the opportunity to come together as one mind. In her writing, in her book, um, Jennifer really pushes home the point that ideas matter. And there are few more important topics for us to come together and share ideas and information about than suicide. I'm grateful to each of you for being here today and for being willing to engage in this conversation about how we can support one another while we are living together in community. Our speaker today can help us approach this issue with new eyes. Please help me welcome Jennifer Michael Hecht. It's so nice to be here and so nice to see all of you and I get to step a little out of the lights and be able to see you. Um, so I'm just going to tell you my story. I, uh, I'm a poet, 
got a couple of books out. I do readings. I'm in the poetry world. I'm also a historian and a philosopher. Uh, my PhD is in history of science. Um, Barnes and Noble started shelving my books in philosophy, so ta-da, I'm a philosopher. Um, <laughs> I guess, in, uh, in a certain sense, I'm a historian of ideas. Uh, that's a category that sort of went out of style, but it's, it's what make, really makes most sense of, of what I, I do. Um, history of science taught me a lot about methodology, a lot about tracking ideas through history. And then I just sort of went in a lot of directions with it. So I was already sort of well known as a poet. and. And I, my book, Doubt a History, which is a history of religious doubt all over the world uh, throughout time, all over. Um, history of people doubting what they were told, which often results in new religions. It's not that it always results in atheism, but it's the questioning part. The, hey, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's who I was when I, uh, when I learned that a friend of mine had taken her life. We weren't that close anymore, but we had been close back when we were all at graduate school. Um, I was in the history department, she was in the English department, but we were poets. And um, poetry is a, uh, when you really get into it, it's quite a dedication. So you end up at parties with other poets, and you, um, you go to readings, and you have these relationships. So even though we had been close back then, uh, and hadn't been really close for a long time. We kept seeing each other all the time um, and catching up. And I knew she had hard times, but I, 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 I didn't see that exactly coming. Um, and yeah, it breaks your heart. More than you can explain why it should. More than another death of a different sort. It just breaks your heart. And so um, I didn't feel like I had any special knowledge about this, but it was from that position, which only much later in my journey do I also add into that I was a little suicidal too. Uh, I've never been the kind of person who was making a plan, but I saw images of myself doing it when I got mad at myself, when I felt I said something wrong at a party. Um, I, I blamed myself, and even if I, in my head I was 100% sure that I was just a normal person doing normally dumb things sometimes, um, that was something that went through my mind. Uh, I didn't talk about it because it didn't seem serious, but it was dark and scary. Um, and I did think everyone had a right to it. I was raised on that same sort of existential I mean, even in college courses, that's what they teach. You know, the Sartre and Camus idea that suicide is really a choice and it's a pillar of our autonomy. That's something we should be proud of, that it means that when we're alive, it's a choice and therefore we must keep it that way. You know, that whole idea. But after my friend did it, I ended up writing a poem. It's interesting being a poet because, because as a historian or a journalist, you start from facts. But as a poet, you start from your, your gut. You just put down what you can put down. Every time, it's a blank page, and you don't know where you're going. And I ended up writing this poem called The No Hemlock Rock, which Garrison Keillor, I don't know if you know it, he, he picked it up, and he gave it a, like an old jukebox parenthetical extra title, Don't Kill Yourself, um, because that's what the poem says. And I've actually left it on now. I think it's. I think it's cool that people, because people remember that title. So, but yeah, so in this poem, I said, I said, if you shoot yourself, it cracks the biodome. If you poison yourself, it poisons the well. Um, I also said a lot of wacky things that poems are allowed to say. And I do say, you're going to lose a lot staying alive when you don't want to. People will know that you're kind of crazy. Let them. Let them. Be absurd. Forget being normal. It takes a while, but do that instead. Just the one thing don't do, don't kill yourself. So again, I thought it sort of stopped at the poem, but people picked up the poem and reposted it as, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So I knew I had something, but I was still working on other projects. And then about a year and a half after my first friend did it, a mutual friend of ours, the three of us hung around at Columbia together. Uh, she's also a poet. Two of them were very successful poets. 
um, books, jobs. Um, Rachel was the, was, had just become the um, poetry editor for the New Republic, a very prestigious post. Uh, they, they were great poets writing about deep things. Um, and then uh, right, right on Christmas Day, a year and a half after Sarah did it, Rachel did it. And again, I didn't talk about this part until much later, but these happened to be, maybe happened to be, maybe there were more. I had been down to, like really down, like really fighting to, to find a way to feel okay. Um, but that was private in my world at that time. That was not something I was going to talk about. Um, I didn't even really know it enough to talk about. It was in the background for me. But, but when it happened the next time, it was about two weeks after, and I wrote this blog post. I used to post all the time on Best American Poetry, mostly literary things. I talk about Emily Dickinson and Yeats. And, um, and I just ma made this blog post that was really about everything I'd been thinking about for the year and a half since the first friend did it. And, and in this blog post, I said, don't kill yourself. We need you. We need each other. I said, I never knew how connected I was to other people until these two friends did this and made me realize how much they mattered to me as people, but also as we're all holding up the sky together. Imagine yourself, you wake up tomorrow alone on the planet. Would you do anything the same? To keep studying these books, to keep having breakfast in the morning and dinner at night? We make meaning together. We realize that when we look up meerkats, you couldn't just pick one up and stare at it in the lab and figure out what meerkats are about. They're a community. They make meaning. We make meaning. We make meaning for each other in all sorts of ways that we don't normally understand. I mean, I can just remind you of a couple of them. You know, if people are drinking and smoking, you drink and smoke more. If people are having a third child, you don't stop at one. If everyone's only having one, you stop at one. These are huge life decisions. The point is that we feel in this culture so individual, so independent. Never through history has, have people felt this independent. Throughout all of history, there, there was one good fire in every house, one good hearth. And if you were cold and bored, you went around the hearth, and people have always been annoying. They talk about you, they brag, they repeat themselves, they say terrible jokes. They are annoying. But when there's no television and, and video, guess what? They're your best bet. <laughs> and when you can't, you know, in the summer, everyone went on the porch where there was a nice breeze. So you were with people. Of course you walked away wishing that you didn't have to be with them. But then you walked back, and it was good. We're in a very weird position where we can climate control, have our own rooms, have our own entertainment, and we like it. We vote with our feet. We like it. In 1950, the United States became the first place where most houses had more rooms than people. And we just keep going in this direction. The potential for isolation and loneliness is tremendous. We like it, but it's not good for us. All it takes is to say to yourself, um, if I'm down, i got to force myself to go be with people. Um, it'll be worth it. I'm telling you, go be with people when you feel bad. It helps, even though you hate it in a way. Do it anyway. I do it anyway. I try. I don't always manage. But I am saying that we live in a particular historical moment that has freed us because of temperature control, because of entertainment needs, but also because of freedoms. Used to be everyone had to go to church or temple once a week. You, you could get arrested for not. So of course people didn't want to go and went anyway. Some people wanted to go. Some people didn't want to go. Some people were bored out of their minds. Some people looked around at the hypocrisy and it drove them crazy. But they had to be with people once a week. So I wrote this piece that was based on my historical knowledge. I'd already been a history professor for many years. I knew a tremendous amount of history. So I didn't actually look this thing up and check all the details. I just wrote in a, in a moment. I was in shock. I was in shock. But when Sarah died, Rachel wrote the posthumous afterward 
for her, her book, her last book. And in it, she was as shocked and as upset as I was. And then she did it. I was in shock. And all I was thinking was, I wish I could have saved them. I had dreams where I would, Sarah jumped, and I, I had dreams of grabbing her, and some dreams I got her, and other dreams I just came away with a jacket. I, I wanted to go back and save her, and I couldn't. So I started thinking about saving the next person who's on the roof now. Uh, and that's who I wrote this blog post for. But I wrote it with a lot of history in it. Because I'd already sort of, because of my historical knowledge, I, I'd, I had a sense that there were people, I had a sense that religion had gone too far in its criticism of suicide. And that that had created a situation where modern secular life went too far in the other direction. There have been a lot of experiences like this. The Enlightenment questioned whether, hey, if we get rid of the monolithic church, maybe there'll be no more marriage, and we'll all just do it whenever we want. Well, that didn't turn out to be how human beings are made. Turns out that if religion isn't all true, it was still partially made from people, and people have some needs because we're people. It's not something you can prove in a lab, but it is something that's pretty evident, that a lot of us need to have a loyal friend who's in our corner, and we're willing to do a lot of sacrificing to keep that person. Right? So it turned out Diderot was wrong. We weren't going to get rid of marriage. We weren't at all. It didn't turn out to be as religious a thing as it had looked like when the church was in control of it. Once the church wasn't in control of it, it turned out people still wanted to get married a lot of the time. A lot of differences, a lot of divorce, a lot of changes, lots of more freedom, lots of different people allowed to get married now, all sorts of changes. But the basic ideas, which some people felt right after the church was losing power in the modern world, they thought, oh, once this is gone, we'll do whatever we want all the time. Nope, it doesn't turn out to be who we are. So I started thinking that maybe the church prohibition, or the religious prohibition against suicide had gotten out of control. And that's what I said in this blog post. Again, I was working on other things. But it kind of went a little viral. I don't know what the stats for viral is. But... And then the Boston Globe, a big newspaper in Boston, wrote to me and asked me if they could publish it in their print copy. And they did on the back of their Sunday ideas section in this big, beautiful, you know, blue background thing. Um, they cleaned it up a little. And then I got tons of emails and tons of real letters from people. People who were in a lot of pain, people who were suicidal, people who had lost a child to suicide, people who slipped my article under the door to somebody who wasn't talking. Um, people who said, I didn't even know you could ask them to stay. I thought it was so much their right, it was so much not my business how much pain they were in, that I wasn't even allowed to ask. And I'd sort of given them permission to say, I need you. We need you. We need each other. I'm staying for you. You stay for me. It was an idea. But I got so much response from it that, and at that point, no negative response. Later, a surprising kind of negative response came where there were people who were really vociferously arguing for their right to, um, to do whatever they wanted with themselves. And, hey, I learn a little from them, and I'm still thinking about it. And I do think there are extents to things. And I'm not at all talking about end-of-life care. We're in a culture that, you know, 300 years ago, the average, maybe not median, but the average person died in their 30s or 40s. We're in a culture that keeps you alive so long that if you're much older and in pain, I didn't put this in the book, but my casual rule is, if there are some people in your family, some people in your friends, some people in your medical people who agree that you've been through too much and we're not getting better and it's over, fine, you figure that out. I'm talking about all the other people who not one person who looks after them or loves them would be okay with that decision. And I add to that, neither would the person in a different mood. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, our moods do not believe in each other. And I think we should all write it on the wall, <laughs> right? 
especially depression, is a sneaky, sneaky thing about making you think you always feel that bad. I got a letter from someone. This one isn't mine. I got a letter from, got a, letter from a lawyer who he had four children, two from two different marriages. He was happy in his marriage now, but he also still loved his ex-wife and took care of her. She was ill. Um, he told me that he'd been suicidal most of his life and that he still thought that that's what might happen until he read my book, the part that really got him. And he kept saying, I'm so dumb. I don't know why I didn't see this until I saw it in black and white. But there have been a ton of very careful studies that show if, you, if a parent of children 18 or under, uh, if the parent takes their life, mom or dad, the children's suicide rate goes up fivefold. Um, that this is a after they've uh, I've completely accounted for mood-related mood um, uh, hereditary problems. Um, they account for them in a bunch of different ways, just excluding from the population anyone where you can find that. Um, they compare it to people whose parents die in accidents. Compare it to, there's just, there's no way around it. The idea of suicide gets in people's heads. And if a parent of someone 18 or younger, much better results after that, but still, of course, suicide rate goes up. But it, it, it made this lawyer write to me and say, I'm never going to do this. It now is so clear that I w what I would be doing to my ex-wife, my wife, who I love, my kids. A lot of fathers sometimes think, oh, she'll just remarry someone who makes more money, cries less, and drinks less. It'll be better for everyone. But no. The kid is just a person whose father killed themselves. It doesn't matter who she remarries. All of this sounds sad, except the flip side is so wonderful. We matter. We matter in ways we don't always notice. We're holding up the sky with each other. Crying and useless is a million times better than dead. Uh, more than half of suicide notes say, I'm a burden. Where'd they get that idea? We're, we live in a culture that encourages us, uh, us to look in the mirror, decide whether we're pretty enough, decide whether we're doing enough, decide whether we're having a good enough time, decide whether we're contributing enough, and then compare that to our pain. And the culture says, it's up to you. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. It's not the right thing for people to be saying to each other. There are extents where it becomes un there are extents where you can go to other people and talk about this. Well, one thing we have to know is, look, of course you could go, you should go see someone and talk to them. I encourage you with all my heart, whether you're suicidal or not. I'm in therapy now. I learn so much about the world, about perception, um, and a lot of things I thought were going to keep me crazy all my life are gone. I worked them through. They took years. But I'm a, I'm a philosopher and a poet, so for me, I, there's no downside. It's, well, it's a tremendous amount of work and it costs money, but it, I learn. Imagine trying to know the universe through two little peepholes in a little blob organism with a shell that lives for a tiny fraction of time. Do you know the dinosaurs were around for 165 million years and they started dying off 65 million years ago? and human beings have been human for about 200,000. We all wandered out of South Africa. 200,000. I mean, and then our little lives, 70, 80 years, and you're supposed to know about reality from your two little peoples? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> so that's what therapy is for me. It's both working out my stuff, and I got stuff to work out, but it's also I want the bigger picture. I want to know what it looks like from somebody else's eyes because I'm trying to figure stuff out that I cannot figure out until I can get into other people's heads. But I am saying also that even though the biggest important part is to get someone to talk to and work out the things that cause you pain because of the neglect and trauma that you experienced, which at your age you still don't know was neglect and trauma. I, at your age, I didn't know. Um, there's something about childhood that explains stuff away. And then in your 20s, you start to notice, wait, nobody else here wasn't allowed to drink milk. What the? <laughs> what was going on there?
that's also how you become a writer. You start to realize, oh, I got a weird story to tell. What I thought was just average, no. Not everyone was doing that. But it's also, it takes a while to realize your parents were raised with neglect and trauma. They couldn't help but raise you with neglect and trauma most of the time. So we're in pain, but we can work it out. But I'm setting that aside. I'm saying a big sign of get that help. But I also want to tell you, most people who commit suicide never got help. They lived in places where there was therapy and counseling, and they didn't do it. Um, more than 60% of college students who kill themselves were not going to the counseling services. Um, most of the people who kill themselves in the Army, and, and that's an incredible number these days, weren't going to counseling. Um, which makes me reiterate, go. And don't go because you feel, I mean, don't feel bad about it. Remember, it's, I think it's the center of wisdom at our moment in history. It's a way to get wise. So it's not just that you're, it's not that you're weak or whatever. I mean, we're all weak. But, but the thing I want to impress upon you is that ideas matter too. That you can't think away depression, but suicide's a behavior. And you can think that away. I know some people kill, them, kill people. But I bet all of you have had a homicidal thought, especially if you're driving already, right? Just a thought, just a thought, like, oh, that would be great if that person would just explode. <laughs> but we don't then say, hmm, I had this dark thought. Maybe I should think through whether this means something and I should go kill that person. Because we know that's wrong. Well, I'm here to tell you suicide is wrong. And if you give it some thought, you can take it off the table. That lawyer who I brought up, he told me it was a relief to be done with it, a big relief. But he also told me, and this is why I was telling him his story, that he writes himself a note when he's happy. Because only if it's in his own handwriting can he believe that he ever actually was happy. I don't even write the note anymore, but I remember it. I do. It worked. All of this worked for me. I do think suicidal thoughts sometimes, and I think I, I treat them the way I, th I treat homicidal thoughts. I say, that's not what people like me do. Forget that. I don't want to do that. That's all. And it's like, it's not even hard anymore. Ideas matter. And when I got all those notes from people after the Boston Globe piece, as a historian, I felt I got to check everything I just said. I tell people all the time, you want to know how to write a book? You know something your friends don't know. Sit down and write that. Don't try to be brilliant. Brilliant is for later. Just sit down and say what your friends don't know, but check all the reasons you believe the things you believe. More than half of them, you'll have got it a little wrong. I always remember something a little wrong. I always forgot the context a little. I go back and I read Augustine. I say, oh, he was saying this. Ah, I remembered only this part. So when you go back and you see, you start to get all the history, I was, um, the basic story was true. I, I found that religion had been sort of unbelievably negative to, to suicide, and that that's why the Enlightenment period goes in the other direction. But there was a lot there that I hadn't expected or, or, or known. Um, and I'll tell you, so I go back and I find that Christianity was profoundly against suicide. But it didn't start out that way which makes sense, because Christianity comes out of ancient Judaism and ancient Greek and Roman thought. And neither of those traditions was very much against suicide. Uh, Samson in the Hebrew Bible uh, asks God not, could you get me out of this, but rather, could you help me pull down these pillars, kill all them, kill all the Philistines, but also kill me. He says it right out. He knows it's going to happen. And that's what God gives him strength to do. There are other uh, ancient Hebrew texts that say, you must not kill yourself. You're, you're worth more than you know at the moment you feel that way. So you must not do it. Um, and of course, uh, many theologians have just taken, thou shalt not kill. You know, they say, they say you shouldn't covet your neighbor. If they're mentioning your neighbor there, if they meant just your neighbor with the kill, they'd have said that. So we should, thou shalt not kill. But uh, the ancient world was kind of, uh, mixed about suicide. 
What I mostly heard as a historian was that they were almost pro-suicide. That's not what I found when I looked. What I found when I looked was that there were situations where the larger community was in need of some kind of sacrifice. And when someone killed themselves in that situation, they would be celebrated for it. But then there were all these things I didn't expect. There were also the Stoics who said, you should, if you hate life, you should leave as you would leave a smoky room. You know, and that, but that was the most positive thing I saw about suicide. And there were lots of Stoics who did take that as a, the, this big philosophical position that you shouldn't cling to life too much. And look, if you're dying and you can't help but be dying, it's a good message. Remember, comes and goes. Everyone only lives a certain amount of time. Eternity on both sides. Don't worry about it too much. But most of the ancients said that you need to live. They said you should stand at your post as a guardsman at his post. Socrates, we remember as having taken the hemlock. But in that room where he took the hemlock, he told his friends and students, you must never do this unless you too are found guilty by, by a democratic trial. He said you can't do it because you matter too much to other people. Through history, I found a lot of this idea of mattering to other people. I also saw this other thing which I hadn't quite thought of, which is about your future self. And our modern ideas of culture blind us to both of those. So we imagine ourselves as the same person going through our lives. We know our cells are replaced every seven years. You don't have even, you know, but we, we know all this stuff, but we still think of ourselves as integrated selves. It's very hard for us to remember that 10 years from now, you don't know who you're going to be. You don't know what you're going to get. You don't know what you're going to know. And just have enough faith in that guy. Have enough respect to just wait, to, to just not kill him. See what happens. So that's something else I saw expressed through history. But the bigger thing was always this idea of other people. So what happens with Christianity? Well, I'll tell you. The martyrdoms were a big deal. Christianity was illegal. It was a sect. It was an illegal cult. And Roman emperors were torturing and killing them. And so during this very early period of Christianity, there were times when the emperors would actually say, is there anyone else in this crowd who's, who wants to die, of Christ who wants to die for Christianity? And people would raise their hands, and he literally said, look it up. Go do it yourselves. The court's tired. And they did. So there became this thing of martyrdom that was very big and was in defense of Christendom and in defense of the church. But in 313, the emperor Constantine makes Christianity no longer illegal. He doesn't make it the state religion, but he makes it no longer illegal. There's a little blip afterwards where it becomes illegal again, but that doesn't last long. So after 313, the church starts to realize, and the martyrdoms keep happening. That is, people keep killing themselves in the name of Christianity. And so the church starts to say, wait, this is no longer in defense of us. This is us losing members. And so they start to make Christianity uh, they start to make suicide illegal. The first thing they do is say, on the list of martyrs, if you killed yourself because you really just wanted out, God's going to know, and you're not one of them. And then, then they, they, like, that's like, that's like 473, um, the Council of Arles. And then they have another council. In the, in, in the 400s and 500s and 600s, the councils get more and more explicit that suicide is wrong, that you couldn't be buried in the churchyard. By the 11th century, they were torturing corpses, um, really torturing corpses, drawn and quartered. A suicide was drawn and quartered, left naked hanging, left for the dogs to eat, embarrassing. And then by the 12th century, they're confiscating the estate. So your family's going to be destitute. Did it help? Yeah, it helped. We have notices of people. We have notes from people saying, OK, I'll make it through my bad time. And sometimes they said they were glad. But you could see how this isn't very pretty. And when Luther and Calvin come along, they say, they change it a little bit. Luther says, Every suicide was tempted by the devil. So it's really the devil's fault, but we have to make it 
we have to punish people because we need to show other people that you shouldn't listen to the devil. We also have evidence that that helped. Um, this wonderful story from like 1560, uh, this woman telling that she fought all night holding the knife, but she thought she was just being fought over by the devil and God. But that idea gave her the strength to fight through. So what happens when you get to the Enlightenment is people who either don't believe in God or, m much more frequently, believe in God, but they don't believe in a God that would care if you did this, that would care about your behavior. Uh, the Scottish philosopher David Hume said, if God doesn't want me to kill myself because that would be disrupting his plan, then he also doesn't want me to step out of the way of a rock that's falling, and that's silly. Um, there, there were these arguments that we can do whatever we want. And they really got too far. Um, we see this idea again bloom in the early 20th century. Um, I always thought of Camus as a kind of a guy who was sort of promoting suicide. The first line of his great book, The Myth of Sisyphus, is, is there's only one philosophical question, and that's suicide. First decide that, and then we can go on to ontology or whatever. But uh, the rest of the book is all about how he thinks we must not kill ourselves, that life is worth it. He says we're not going to be happy. Most of the time, life is really hard. We're not going to be happy, but it's worth it for the knowledge, for the experience. He's not one who's talking about community at all, but he's brilliant. And uh, I've met more people who have felt that he helped back them up. Meanwhile, when I see a, 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 a movie that's showing a, a philosophy class in a college, they're all, you know, they're the ones wearing black and, you know, their hair in front of them. You know, they're, it feels like philosophy classes in college are supporting this very bleak existential view. I believe that the feeling of meaning is sufficient to the definition of meaning. Just as the feeling of love is sufficient to the definition of love, I don't need some third source of love out there. I believe in love, even though sometimes I don't feel it, sometimes it makes me angry, but I know that other people are feeling it, and I know that I have felt it, and I hang on. I believe that meaning is the same thing. The feeling of meaning is real. I know that the galaxies, there are millions of galaxies, and there are millions of quarks, and the whole thing is bigger than us and smaller than us, and we're this insignificant, except that the human heart is as big as all of that. We're, we're this tremendously deep, inexplicable thing, and somehow we're it together. And we have to fight for it. And we have to make sure that the recent fight between religion and secularism doesn't blind us to the idea that no matter what you believe, we're in this thing together. I, I know it's a strange thing to say, but we love each other. I don't know exactly why, but we do. And especially your elders love you, even though they don't always know you. And we just need to try to hang on and to keep building meaning and to believe that the human heart is as true a thing as anything else. So I wrote this thing very much from a standpoint of history and philosophy. I go through, I show one philosopher after another saying, stay alive for these different reasons. But in the end, it's the heart. It's the end. In the end, it's what you guys know in your own it's the pain you feel when you lose someone. Turn that around and realize that's the strength you're giving other people just by persevering. Thank you so much for coming. And we can, we can do some questions if, if, you're, if you feel like it, if you could come up to the mic so that the live streaming could hear. I know some of you have to leave, but, but please, if you have any questions, do come on up.
Okay. Hello? Hi. Hello? Okay, cool. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk a lot. Uh, the question I had is that you mentioned yourself as a historian of ideas. Yeah. What do you think makes the idea of suicide so pervasive and do you, what cultural elements, do you, you mentioned the individualism that we're experiencing in the U.S., uh, what other cultural elements do you think can sustain that idea or can make it last long, make it last? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we're definitely in a period that's a rise of suicide. Um, in the year 2000, our census showed we'd lost in America 30,000 a year on average, and last time we checked it was up to 40,000 a year. Um, and who? The World Health Association says in the last um, 45 years, the suicide rate's gone up worldwide 60%. Suicide kills more people than homicide in the U.S. and almost everywhere. Kills more people than war. Um, kills more people than most diseases. Kills more people than AIDS, except in the three worst uh, years of, of the disease. What's happening, part of it is... I really do think part of it is just is the way we talk about it, so that when we're in this bad place, we don't have this message of, hey, you're in a bad place. I, I, again, I get letters from people who tell me that they have guns for hunting, but they keep the guns with a friend, so that at least you have to do something. In, uh, in the 90s, the UK was having a lot of suicides by acetaminophen, by Tylenol, which, by the way, is a horrible way to kill yourself. It's just, miserable. But you know what they did? They put fewer pills. They legislated and put fewer pills in the bottle. And the suicide rate went down. So, and also when we put up barriers on bridges, it works. People don't just go to another bridge. They go home. So I think there are ways that we need to communicate to, to, to each other that we matter and that we care. And I think that we're way too cavalier about, oh, that can't help. That won't matter. Actually, these little things can matter and do matter. And so the, right now we live in a moment, and this is controversial, uh, uh, this is what I believe. I believe that we are way overstating the biological aspect of mental health today. I, I think, uh, as a historian of science, I see the pendulum swing all the time, and I think we're way over to that it's biological right now. Um, and that makes people feel like suicide is the end point of a natural disease that nothing could be done about. And they love to throw their hands up about it. But that's not my experience. I feel like people go through something and they come back and report that, that they feel stronger from it. So w one thing is for sure to find a way to talk about it. Um, but yeah, there's no, I mean, I think I hear in your question also this question of values. Um, and I do think we have to make a move to make that happen. Um, wonderful philosopher Anthony Appiah wrote a book called The Honor Code about how dueling, Chinese foot binding, and the Atlantic slave trade, all three of these things were wasteful and horrible. And they went on for centuries. And then within kind of a generation, within like a couple of decades, people decided they were gross and awful and good people don't do these things. And it stopped. We can stop some things. And I think if we could push back the suicide thing to more reasonable historical levels, the future might look back at us and think it was a massacre, you know? And that what it took was us to stand up for each other a little bit. Yes, please. Um, I, I really appreciate what you're trying to do as far as like looking at the history of it. But I, um, uh, I'll just okay. start with my, my personal story. So I'm 40, 41 years old, and I have seen the approach and the stigmatization, stigma, um, um, yeah. stigmatization of um, so many things change in my scant 41 years. My, my mother shot herself when I was 18 months old, and I have Sorry. been acutely aware of suicide throughout my history and its effect um, on young people and my own personal relationship with it and has and the romanticism of it she died at a time when there was this really like overblown hippie romanticism when diane arbus and sylvia plath and all these different writers and um other people were were committing suicide in in, a, in and there was a very 
romantic idea about suicide. My mother was also very young. She was 21 years old when she shot herself, and I was 18 months old. And um, so I've been, it's been something that's been like, I'm, I've been very aware of it every moment of my life. Yeah. Um, I think the approach to looking at it, because it is such a very, very personal and highly charged yep. topic, um, looking at it from a very Christian, especially in Colorado Springs, approach loses people extremely quickly. Mm -hmm. But there's a personal journey and a personal transformation that takes place when a massive loss occurs throughout your life. And I think through that journey and transformation, connecting to other people is a, is a more powerful way to connect. Because I think at an early age, when you're first starting out in your life and you're that age that my mother was, 21, I remember reaching her age and feeling similar feelings. And I think what you said about children whose parents have committed suicide um, having a higher rate of suicide is interesting and, and also necessary to, to kind of understand because you carry the story of your parents. Yeah. And if they're gone, the way that you're trying to connect to it is by being that and carrying that. Yeah. So I think that there's, I mean, I waited until I was over 35 to have children because I didn't know if my mother was schizophrenic. Right. I didn't know. And I've looked, I mean, she left a note. She left journals. She left all kinds of things. But there's a very specific biochemistry piece that happens within the mind of somebody and the heart and the body of somebody who does commit suicide. Yeah. And that piece is a piece of this infinite suffering that we all have as human beings. And, and the way that I've put it contextually within my own life to understand it and to not take my own life is to understand that I am right in the middle. In this country, we are so frequently in the middle of the vast body of suffering of humanity. And to see it that way, to me, I have a feeling that God is indifferent and um, that my connection to the universe has meaning, but it's not through a, um, I'm not going to find it through my, my connection to God and my connection to religion. What I'm going to find it is, again, what you said, through my connection to others. Yeah. But to find that and to get to that journey of um, going through the process of understanding yeah. suicide, I, I had this feeling during your talk that you were talking topically on it in a way that was um, not reaching the depth of what that suffering is because there's so much chemically going on and to change that chemistry is like, I'm going to stop you here, though. I, I want to thank you so much for talking. And, and I do think that one of the very few things that I hope to get out of, to give out of these kinds of talks is to open up room for conversation and room for people who have experience to talk about these things, because there are not a lot of venues. And when they are, they're usually so uh, isolated so that only people with the same kinds of experience I just want to say one last thing. I've seen over the time, I appreciate that you're giving a talk on suicide because it's not something that was even talked about right. 40 years ago. Right. So the fact that we're just talking about it opens the door to some kind of healing. Well, you've brought but, a lot, and, I, and I'm grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's important. Yes, please. Um, I was wondering if you or maybe Heather um, have any suggestions or tools for friends or family that don't that are definitely in pain but don't feel like therapy is something for them or right. are having trouble kind of acknowledging what they're going through and if you have any suggestions about how to be sort of an advocate and a, a friend to those people. Yeah, but I bet you know as much as I do in some ways. I mean, telling people that you see their pain matters a lot to people. Um, I wrote the book so that there would be an easy thing to hand somebody and say, you know, here's, 
here's the idea that this is something that's historically pretty constant. And I've done a sort of casual straw poll, but I've also read lots of very intense statistics and both show me that I think more than half of human beings think about it sometimes. And the people who do think about it think they're very isolated and alone. And sometimes it's okay to just say to somebody, gosh, life is hard, isn't it? Let's try to do this together. Um, but yeah, I mean, the book's in the library and I think it offers um, some things. There's little videos online of me trying to get some of these things across. And, and, and for the other comment, the book that I wrote and my poetry is as much about just saying, you know, suffering can't, suffering is a little bit more useful than we today think it is. If I could take all your pain away, physical and mental, right now, I would do it. But I'm, I'm kind of glad that no one could ever do it, because being human is about this pain. We feel it, though. And the book is a lot about how other moments in history have been aware that you learn from suffering. Find me a great leader who didn't at one point feel humbled to the point of almost, of totally hating themselves. Because that's where you get the wisdom to lead others because of the empathy that your own misery gives you. And the person whose life never treated them that hard, they're never going to be able to do that trick. So part of it is about valuing suffering. <laughs>